Do you got a hot home lab? Are you using active cooling to keep it under control? Do you have something like this that you need to keep cool? These are things that we're gonna to tackle today and we're gonna take a look at some of the things I've done. We're gonna take a look at some of the things that we're going to do. And this is gonna apply also just to anybody, even if you don't have this and you just have a Raspberry Pi cluster, you can cut down on your home energy usage dramatically. Now, if we take a look over here, we have active cooling. This is one thing that people have been asking about is how do you keep your home lab cool? So I use this unit. It is a great unit, running in eco mode 24-7, 365. So right now it's running at about 35 to 40 kilowatts per day. And that is quite a bit of heat load. We're in central Texas. It is very hot here. We have done quite a bit. If you look up here, you can see where we did the drill and fill, blow in insulation in the walls. So all of the wall cavities have that drill and fill. We also blew in R60 up in the attic. We did that last year. And it didn't really occur to me until I stepped in front of these when I was moving some stuff earlier today, how hot these black shades are collecting heat throughout the day. But yeah, you can see 98.2. And sure enough, these are not doing anything aside from helping radiate heat into this area. The sun rises in this direction, so it gets all the AM heat load right directly into these windows. And if we look over here, where our insulated walls are, you can see what we probably should be closer to as far as temperatures, if we can successfully mitigate some of that heat load coming into these windows. Even if you look at the ceiling in here, our ceiling is right around 84 degrees. That's an R60 blow-in that we did. That video, check it out at the link above. That we did last year during the heat of the year. For some reason, always doing these things during the heat of the year. We're gonna see if we can impact how much electricity we are spending. If we can even cut it 10 kilowatts a day, that's $30 a month. So solar screens are something that you can easily mount in most windows if they have an external frame holder. And as you see over here, we've got them on most of the windows on the house. We can remove these if we want to during the winter time, that gives us a little bit better heat. But during the summertime, this cuts down quite a bit on the electric that's used. As well, this is a great privacy feature because we can fully open the blinds on the inside and people can barely see in. If you look here, there's a nice ridge that we've got up here that'll come down. I'm gonna put some magnets up here to retain it on this one. If you look over here, we've got a lip that grooves here on the bottom and it grooves there on the top. So we can put our solar screen in there and it'll be just perfectly fit. And it's actually gonna make this look a hell of a lot better. So one of the things you're gonna need is either a Dremel or a hacksaw to cut through the aluminum. If you have a Dremel, make sure you have plenty of wheels because you're definitely gonna go through more than a few of them. You're also gonna to need to make sure you get some of these screen corners, these screen frame corners that we're gonna to use to connect these together. Now, here are the actual pieces of aluminum that we're gonna use. Try to find ones that match your house uh, color scheme as best as possible so they don't stand out and look really wild. And I've got four of these that are pretty long and I've got one of these that is pretty short, but this should be enough to get the windows that we need done. And of course, you're gonna need your solar screen material. Make sure that you pick out something that's the appropriate level of darkness. The one that we're using is in the links in the description below. Also, you are going to have to have one of these little rolly wheel things. If you don't have one of these, it just simply is not gonna happen for you. And the last thing that you need is some of the screen spline here that we're gonna to use to roll into the groove to hold the screen in place. So if we look here, we've got 33, 33, 45, and 45 and we've got 33 and 33 here as well. And so when you're noticing this sheet here, you then need to translate it to a sheet here if you're using these kind of corners because these corners have a kacha and that is that you need to cut a extra one and a half inches off of each screen piece to allow for this to fit into place. So this right here will allow it to fit into place by doing this cut here that we've got. So 26, from 27 and a half, if that makes sense, 34 and a half becomes 33. So those are the cuts that we need to make. We're gonna do the small one first here. And you wanna make sure as you assemble this that you have the lip all facing on the inside on the same one of these so that they can uh, 
have that spline go in there perfectly with each other. And now you need to take your solar screen and roughly fit it to your frame. Roll it down to the end here a little bit. We're not going to be perfect with it, but I'm going to cut this much off. And if you flip it over on the non-curled side, then it'll allow you to fit it in there probably just a little bit better. And so you want to start on one side and then pull it down and then work on the other and then pull that and then work the other and then pull that and work the other. That way you uh, don't run into a scenario where it's not taut and it's just kind of hanging loose in there. You're going to feed it from the B to the F with this particular model back to front. And so when you start it, You need to kind of have a good idea about where you're starting it at. And after you get the first pass done, you can just use the uh, front roller to do a second pass and make sure everything's pushed down in there nice and good. Because I can guarantee you it won't be. and you need it to be really sunk down in there, that spline. It should roll pretty smoothly like this when you get it there. And using carpet to do this on top of is not a bad idea because it will prevent you from scratching up the front of your screen. If you do this on uh, concrete or something, the anonized metal on your front of your screen will be scratched up really bad. I learned that one the hard way last time. Okay, cool. And the last run that I've got to do here. All right. Now the last thing to do is to go ahead and cut the outside of this. This part, you should definitely make sure you have a reasonably sharp blade and you don't have to go fast here, just go at your own speed, making sure to do a good job cutting this. Just kind of glide along the top of it and then make sure that your tip should be into the top of the metal sheet down there. If you're not, something might be wrong. Also, doing this inside an air-conditioned space, if you're doing this during the summer, it's probably a really good idea. And your first time doing it, it does seem, at many points, like you're going to come out of it like with a, a pretty bad product, a pretty bad screen. But even if you do, you can just go ahead and relay the spline. You need to use new spline if you're going to try again. But other than that, you can try as much as you need until you get it perfect. And we're ready to save some electricity here. So if you're a DIYer like myself, this is a good way to save electricity. Let's go put it in. And there we go. A nice tight fit. So we're gonna put in our second screen here and I kind of bent this one up a little bit so that I would hopefully be able to make the hump over here. That looks like it's gonna fit. Actually, that's in place pretty darn good. I don't think it's really gonna move that much, to be honest with you, but I'm gonna go ahead and put in place a couple of magnets this should hopefully hold it back. And there we go, we've got our solar screens. And certainly the solar screens have done a good job 
but I wanted to take it even further and see if I could cut down the energy usage even more. So I went and I got a piece of foam, gigantic piece of foam. So this is some two inch foam that I got from a home uh, de depot store here. And I cut this and made a cutout for the actual little AC. And now it's like a wall, the same temperature as the wall is the inside of this. So I feel like I've maximized the capability I had to reduce the heat transmission inside here just by using some insulation inside the window that I custom cut. These are expensive sheets of foam. So do be very careful when you're cutting them. You can just cut them again with a uh, carpet knife that like I was using prior. You don't need any sort of a special tool for it, but do take your time, make sure you measure because these are too expensive to break. And I can understand why a little bit, these things are awesome. Now let's take a look at some additional things that we can do that'll help out save some electricity. So let's get up in the attic here. All right, let's get the temperature up here. Oh, it's a lot hotter. Oh, it's a lot, a lot hotter. Whoa. So we're at 154, something like that. Holy cow, that's fucking hot. Underneath this, we're at like 130, 134, but on this hot side up here, yeah, it gets considerably hotter. And I still have to finish this out going all the way. I wanted to get some more of the uh, foam for uh, like I'm using over there so that I can put it in some other areas, but there's so much electrical here. I don't think I'm going to cover any of that up. So really, I just need to put some down over there. That side does catch sun. This side over here never catches sun for the most part. Still hot, still very hot. All right, so whew, just a couple of minutes up here is about all you're going to get before you're I took a piece and I just kind of scabbed it in there so that we would have at least a pretty good seal. Well, it's not a perfect seal, but I do have this piece here. So I can cut a piece for that off. That way I can just reach in there pretty easily. I can already feel it getting colder, actually. I'm trying to line that up as best as possible. Turn off the light. Energy efficiency is awesome. I can tell already this is way cooler. Oh yeah. Because the sides here are essentially insulated up against the edges. So I think that's going to help reduce these temps quite a bit also. Let's take just a quick reading. And so if you didn't catch it last year, before we started building out all the framing for the data center, I wanted to get insulation and drill and fill done in all of the walls and the ceilings. And I did it actually throughout the entire rest of the house. And that was one thing that you definitely should consider as probably one of the best impacts you can have on your energy efficiency is bringing a friend and blowing in a bunch of bags of insulation. You can usually rent that machine for free again at one of like a Home Depot or a Lowe's. And as you can see, one of the things that when I was doing some insulation, I clearly did not do a good job of. You can see here, this bay uh, definitely did not get even close to as much as it should have, is I did not do a good job getting the insulation all the way to the edge of the actual uh, attic uh, rafters. So I have created a gap that is not really great for uh, energy efficiency as a result of that. As well, let's take a look at some of the areas here that are unsealed. Now these are not good, but they are certainly not as bad as what's going on with the attic there. And you can see that that is letting in hot air there for sure, right about 86 degrees or so, but that's not quite as bad as the 93, 94 degrees that we're letting in uh, with the uninsulated part that we've got here. Checking the job that we did here, we can see that we've got a little bit of heat seepage on the edges here. I think some felt crammed in there would probably be really a good idea here to finish that off. And if we're looking at some of the attic here, you can definitely see that while the attic door here is hotter, it's not dramatically hotter like it was before. Now it's just running right around 86 to 87. 
So that's not quite as bad as it was. And you can see that the attic actual place where the insulation is resting right beside it is about 84.5. And if we actually check the racks out here just for some fun, we can see that the racks are actually not incredibly hot. Uh, you can definitely tell that we have some hot gear over here. Uh, definitely a little bit of hot gear over on this side over here. So that's where the majority of the hottest stuff is gonna be is of course the top J-Bod there is gonna have the most heat because heat rises. But if we look over here at our networking switches, we can see that they're not incredibly hot, but I think I can identify pretty well that the Brocade ICX6610 is actually hotter than the Mellanox 6036 above it. And so that is yet another reason that we'll be removing that one here shortly. And if we check over here, we can see a little bit better what those j -bods look like in infrared. And you can see, yeah, we definitely have some heat pooling up here. So I might try adjusting the fans a little bit, see if I can get them pointing a little bit more directly on that. As far as the actual ceiling though, throughout this entire area, this really isn't that bad. So I'm not feeling terrible about the insulation job that I've done on it. I think that's actually acceptable. And if we check the actual panel box here, we can see that that AC is actually the hottest breaker that we've got in there, but it's not running too, too bad. It's uh, about 90, 92 degrees. You can kind of see my ceiling job on the edges here because there's a bunch of exposed edges. So I just use painter tape to go around the edges for now. Uh, eventually I'll come back and do something a little more cocky, I imagine, but that should get it sealed up pretty good. I also filled in this door cavity here with a piece of just the foam. This was a thinner piece, so it didn't cost anywhere near as much, mainly just so that the airflow could be directionally coming out from the backs of the servers and circulating up through this entrance and going back and circulating out through that entrance. Okay, I'm gonna cut this thing in half and then maybe I can actually get it to jam in uh, the side up here. Ah, there's a spider. Maybe this was just a dumb idea to do it like this. Oh, hey, look at that. Okay, so now I found something that works. All right, cool. Easy and cheap. Now for this side over here, I'm gonna try to jam one in down here all the way. I don't know if that's gonna work or not, but if I can get it behind this, it might. And let me know in the comments below what product it is out there that you can get to seal up your garage door edges easily. Cause I have uh, tried some of the like rubberized seals in the past and man, that's actually kind of hard to get those things to stay. Look at that. There we go. Okay. So here's my uh, job that I did on it. Let's uh, tell me how bad it is. I think it's not horrible, but it's certainly not, you know, great. But it is sealed. And so I figured that I could uh, cut some of these little slivers off and then use them for the edges here. So I'm gonna actually go ahead and just jam these pieces in as best as possible to create a very good seal. One thing you do wanna do quite often is change your AC filter and especially the less sealed up your area is, the more environmental things are gonna get collected on this. And I'm gonna show you one nice tr trick here that will have your uh, home lab smelling pretty good here. So if you take a bounce sheet and you kind of have it sticking out just a little bit here, it's gonna make it smell so much better in your home lab. And on this particular unit, you can fit two of those in. So it does take two hands to do that. Let me go ahead and do this real quick. And it also seems to like it actually reduces the electrostatic ever so slightly in the home lab. Kind of have to rip it a little bit to get it over some of these latches, but bounce sheets tear quite easily. 
and it gives just a little bit better filtration than you might get elsewise. Again, these are window AC units, not known for having robust filtering. We'll give that a close up there now. It smells way better already. Oh yeah, way better. Now, this next one is something that everybody can do, and this is an evaluative process. If you think about ways to reduce electricity in your home lab, some of the best things that you can do are evaluate whether you need SSDs, which use substantially less electricity, or whether you need hard drives. That comes down to some data storage questions. Also, be mindful of add-on PCI cards and whether or not they can enter power saving states. For instance, this Connect X3 and this Connect X2 do not properly enter power state saving states. So sometimes getting more advanced electronics does pay off as far as wattage for the power saving states being able to be entered into. As well, if you're looking at what your efficiency is on a power supply for something like home lab gear that is server based, you can look for platinum stuff and usually pay about the same price as you might for something lesser quality. In addition to that, size your workloads. So what do I mean by that? If you see here, I've got a 750 watt power supply and I've got a 495 watt power supply. There's power efficiency curves. So if you're running 100 watts, which one of these are you gonna be better off on? Let me just ask you that. Sound off in the comments below and let me know what you think. All right, now, you're definitely gonna be better off with this one here and the reason why is that this is going to be closer for that 100 watt running load that you would have on it to its power efficiency curve being met, whereas the 750 watt one would be further away from that. This holds true for most power supplies, so don't oversize your power supplies just for the sake of oversiz oversizing your power supplies. You will use more electricity as well. Do check out the SUU updates sometimes for these actual units can have updates for the power supplies, and those firmwares can help reduce electricity usage as well. The next thing that you probably should be looking at, especially if you've got something like this, and especially if you've got something like these, do you need four processors? Does that really need to happen in your home lab? Sometimes it may, sometimes it may not. Take a guess, let me know what you guys think I'm using most of these four right here. Or do you need, possibly, four cores? Like a Raspberry Pi 4 can supply you with really good power efficiency, as well, there's tons of other four core, kind of power efficient little setups. There's eight core systems coming onto the market now. Really, those might be better for some workloads. Or do you just need a single core, like this Raspberry Pi Zero W? And if you can get your hands on the Zero W too, good luck doing that. But those could be really good power efficient ways to run anything in your home lab. As well, this one is something you may not think about, especially if you're not using uh, certain types of RAM. But if you're looking here at registered RAM, or if you're looking at load reduced RAM, there is a difference in the voltage. Now, you can have some negative side effects sometimes from road running load reduced RAM. However, most of the time, for most use cases, you're probably gonna be fine, and you're gonna save a little bit of electricity. Is it gonna be a lot? Well, it is just, you know, a decimal point of a volt, but if you times that by however many sticks you have, that can add up to actually be quite a lot. As well, size up your workload for what you're doing. Do you need to do a couple of transcodes? Maybe, maybe a Tesla P4, maybe run some headless gaming, maybe not the most recent headless gaming, maybe a Tesla P4 could be your boo. Do you need a 3090? These are things to think about. Size your electronics that you're using to the workload that you're actually utilizing. And so you can save a lot of electricity by planning out just a little bit before you start jumping into a home lab so that you get the right kind of setup, whether it is server-based or whether it's Raspberry Pi-based or whether it's just a killer workstation desktop that can do basically everything under the sun and kill it with PCIe 4 speeds. And one of the most important things that you can do to save electricity in a home lab setup is to engage in running virtual machines as much as possible. And so you don't necessarily have to have the latest and greatest hardware to do this either. 
You can do this on even older things like Ivy Verge class Xeons. You see here, I've got 377 gigabytes of RAM, and that allows me to put a ton of not only VM, but also I've got a pertainer host, and that pertainer Docker host is hosting a ton of machines in addition to these virtual machines. And even though these are older E5 2667v2 processors, this is still relatively fast. Certainly, you should have a bias if you are acquiring new hardware to buying new things. Be sure to check out some of the guides that I've put together recently on things like Epic Builds, which are ideal for doing virtualization hosting. And you look at how many machines this would take to run if each one of these was running independently. You can see quickly why it's important to virtualize your infrastructure. Monitor and know your actual power usage. There's a ton of people that may not have sophisticated UPSs or PDUs that are gonna log it for you, but that doesn't mean that you have to be in the dark about what your actual power usage is. And even something as simple as a kilowatt will do a great deal of logging for you. You can also get a power cable that is a two to one so that you can monitor things like dual PSU servers. Also make sure that you have a good logging system in place if you are buying smart electronics or smart appliances. This AC right now is about $350. Check the links in the description below for all this, but this does actual power monitoring, which is great because I can see what's going on with the unit over time and I can track whether or not I'm using more or less electricity as a result of some of the things that I'm changing. And many servers are going to have built-in power monitoring on them. So this is a R720 XD and as you can see here it does keep track of the wattage that is being used over time and it can change out hardware and see if there's changes and you can monitor the impacts of that usually inside your BMC on any server class hardware. Sometimes that is included in the price like with the Dell iDRAC systems. So the next thing to consider is eventually every piece of hardware has come to its lifespan's end of effective usefulness. And a big part of this oftentimes has to do with the wattage that is used. And as you can see down here, they definitely are in this category. While they are quad socket and they are incredibly fast, they use just too much power to do what they do. And so when you look at the efficiency of a machine like that and you compare it to something like an Epic 64 core, you can see just so much difference. This is so much more powerful and it is actually just one CPU. It has good idle states. It does not eat a full kilowatt of electricity idling. This, these eat a full kilowatt of electricity idling. Only can be turned on, only can be plugged in if they are going to be utilized. This eats about four watts with the power off and the BMC running. That is totally acceptable for something that is a powerhouse. 256 gigabytes of RAM, AMD Epic Rome CPU, tons of PCIe 4 connectivity. This is significantly more efficient. It is more expensive. However, the thing to consider is what is your electric rate? Will you use this machine? And this is gonna tie in very strongly at the end with what I say and some of the things that we're looking at. If you are looking at your machines, if you've got racks of machines, or if you've just got a single machine, or you've got possibly a couple of older machines, it's always good to consider and put together a spreadsheet of what your planning looks like as far as the removal of certain machines from your actual setup that may not be as energy efficient as you need them to be and also as productive as you want them to be. Because the best home lab machines are the home lab machines that you're going to be using 24 seven, 365 for all the needs that you have. And so one of the things you want to keep in mind whenever you are doing evaluation on your home lab setup is some of your machine planning and definitely have a plan for what machines you're keeping, what machines you're evaluating and which machines you're probably gonna be getting rid of. And I have a sheet that I use that I think is pretty decent for doing this. Looks at a lot of things like the power availability, looks at things like how much capacity I have as far as flash and SSD, 
and it also has a tab for machine planning. And as you can see here, if it is in red, it is in trouble. I am thinking of getting rid of it really soon. And if it is in blue, it is going through an evaluation process, whether or not I see if I can offload its workload to one of the machines in green. So that allows me to have a significantly lower footprint as I continually refine what I have in my home lab. And certainly one of the biggest ways that you can actually have good takeaways and results and efficiency in your lab setup is to use it frequently. So send off in the comments below and let me know what you're doing, what projects you're undertaking right now to help set up your lab and make it better than it's ever been before. I know that my lab in the past two years has undergone quite a few changes. And if I look at the power efficiency of this setup, it is actually not that bad considering how much is in use right now on this system. Over two petabytes of storage, 40 gigabits of networking, iCarumba, tons of 10 gigabit networking, tons of processing and compute. And I am very happy that I am moving to some more advanced systems because those will expand my capabilities even more than some of the older systems that I've been using for the past two years. So let me know what you're doing in the comments below and let me know how you're optimizing your efficiency of your home lab setup and what things are exciting you and what things are challenging you. Do be very careful with what you're doing. If you're in an attic, keep in mind, attics are incredibly hot in the summertime and you can definitely get into a very bad situation incredibly quick. As well, there's all sorts of dangers in your attic, everything from sharp nails to things like falling through the attic. So make sure that you're very safe with whatever you're doing and I look forward to reading in the comments below what kind of things you're doing to update your lab. Everybody have a great rest of your day and I'll check you guys out next time.